their initial uh, concept was not to be gangsters. It was just to do reality stuff. Okay? It was all about reality. And some point in time, a reporter labeled them gangster rappers, and they changed their direction. They bought into their own publicity. And if you know guys like I know guys, you know, people, oh, you a hater. Not a hater, dude. Not a hater at all. Okay? Not a, never been a hater. But I know what the fuck I'm talking about. That's all I can tell you. I know the guys in the interview, they didn't want to uh, represent Compton. How did you uh, Man, pull that off? Dude. Because you're responsible for them representing dude, Compton, right? Dude. I mean, when we first had started World Class Wrecking Crew, we had a serious fight about being from Compton. Me and Yellow was like, man, what the fuck you mean? I, you don't want me from Carson. I don't, I don't want to be from Carson or Gardena. I don't want to be from, <laughs> from Compton. Motherfucker, you are the goddamn drum major for Compton High School. My ass got chased out of Centennial. Dre's ass that's with the Centennial. How in the clientele with the Centennial? How in the fuck we gonna be anyplace else? I'm not a fake motherfucker. <laughs> oh man, Compton, 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 this Compton that. Look, man, I had to call the executive uh, an executive decision. We gonna be from Compton. And to a few years later, this is shit that only I know. And most, of them, I expect them to, to deny the shit. I'm, I'm quite sure that would be the case. Why well, the fuck I got to lie? Okay, but to look up on TV and see everybody claiming Compton, I'm like, ain't this about a bitch? Okay, that was my attitude, and it still is. You know, I'm not mad, but it's just like. If you only fucking knew. This is what this podcast is all about. Not without Alonzo, if you only knew. <laughs> <laughs> so who are some of the people that helped you out? Like, because you help a lot of people out. Who are some of the people that... Man, you know, the people that helped me out, if I told you their name and showed you their picture, you wouldn't know who they were. Oh, okay. But I had a lot of old dudes that were established in business that was always there to give me a helping hand. My first mentor was my dad and when I got tired of cutting trees and chasing lawnmowers and shit he was like okay you want to be a DJ let me take you to my boy who got a nightclub that was Jeff D. Harris he owned the club on Eve After Dark on Avalon North Segundo I went there and I was 21 years old and uh, these two old dudes cut my deal I'm sitting right there but I didn't get a chance to talk I told him what I wanted to do what I, my dad told him what I had been doing and he gave me a deal that I couldn't refuse uh, when I got too big for Dudo, before uh, Eve After Dark, I moved around the corner to Dudo in Compton. And when I got there, I met the owner of Dudo, which is, his name was Dootsie Williams. Dootsie Williams was a genius. And he never, he was a low-key dude, but when I talked to him, when I talked to him, I felt his genius. Now, I'm going to say that not because he, you know, he, uh, he, told me to because I felt it and what I mean by that is old man Ducey Williams wrote the song Earth Angel Earth Angel Earth Angel Please be mine My darling dear Love you all the time If you're not a bebop head a doo-wop head you don't know the song Earth Hey, this motherfucking song has been recorded by everybody the Penguins were the first ones to do it, but he recorded it, and he was one of the first black men to get paid for his royalties. And he schooled me on the record industry. He said, it's a bunch of thieves and no good son of a bitches in this game, but if you have your shit in order, you can get your money. He took Dudos, or I'm sorry, an old helicopter factory, and turned it into Dudos. It was, it was on about an acre and a half, maybe two acres of land, Right there at 135th and Central. What year are we talking about? He said he built this in the 60s. I don't know exactly what, what year it was. It was, in, it was in the 60s. And at that time, Central Avenue, not Crenshaw, was the spot where black folks hung out at. Oh, the big thing was Saturday, Saturday nights. Everybody would dress up and go down Central Avenue. And you'd see all the ladies' fashions. And all the ladies all dressed to kill. And the men their fine suits and their hats. It was so exciting. Central Avenue was just a whole nother world. Central Avenue was the main drag for all black entertainment. It started down down on 39th, I think it was called the 5-4 Ballroom. Again, 
I was a kid. I remember my mama, daddy talking about this shit. But to hear old man Ducey talk about it and why he put doodles on Central Avenue was made was made to stick in my head because he said at the time when he built doodles, Compton was predominantly white. Compton was the American dream, sunny California, with a palm tree in the front yard, the camper, the boat. Temptingly close to the Los Angeles ghetto in the 50s and 60s, it became the black American dream. Open housing paved the way as middle-class blacks flooded into the city. Whites don't buy houses in Compton anymore. And to come into a so-called white neighborhood and see black entertainment was unheard of. And that's what, that's what made Doodle do so, do so, so successful. It's on Central Avenue. Folks from watch L.A., black folks from watching L.A. can come in, see B.B. King, see Blue Bobby Blue Band, Ike and Tina Turner, whoever else was in town, and get back out of town before the cops can fuck with you. And that's what made his thing so successful. But here's another tidbit that you don't know. Old man Jefty, who owned Eve After Dark and Jefty's around the corner on Avalon, where I'm at, also piggyback off of Dudos. If Dudos had you Friday and Saturday, Jeffy might have you Sunday and Monday. Okay? You pay you, you, you paid $5 at Dudos to see him Friday and Saturday, and you might pay $2 to see him at, Je at Jeffy's on S Sunday and Monday. So these are the kind of little tidbits that people don't know, and which I, I feel blessed to be a part of that generation because it makes me like the missing link between all that shit. Mm -hmm. And... I'm glad that we got the digital cameras and podcasts so this information can go on so somebody can keep this story going after I'm out of here. So what year did you actually take it over? I took over Eve After Dark in 1979. Okay, 79. My, my first date was June 6, June 22nd, 1979, six days after my, after my 22nd birthday. Okay, I'm curious. The 79, we're talking the disco era, we're talking drugs. What was the drug scene like back then? The drug scene back then, it was all about Sherm. Oh, oh my God. Sherm okay. was the drug of choice at that time. But now the youth culture that first popularized marijuana is increasingly turning on with another drug, often smoked with marijuana, but far more unpredictable and dangerous. The drug is called angel dust. Oh, my God. Sherm okay. was the drug of choice at that time. In, in fact, even my partner, the guy who I tried to uh, bring into the club with me, Roger Clayton from Uncle Jam's Army, I offered him a partnership in uh, Eve After Dark, and he refused it because there were so many Sherm heads in the area. And what he didn't know is, I knew all the Sherm heads, I knew the guys who sold the Sherm. It's Angel does, horns. <laughs> Sherm was a was fucked up drug known to the hood. Sherm, PCP, Pensacodine, Angel Dust, all that shit. It's the same thing, just uh, delivered in a different method. Sherm was on the Sherm stick. Uh, Lovely was, was on weed. Um, and uh, uh, Angel Dust, Angel Dust you, you can snort that shit or whatever the case may be. But it was just fucked up. And that shit was killing niggas' brain cells. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cats who did it, left it alone real quick if you could. If you can remember to leave it alone, because it was fucking your heads up, and folks got off a of Sherm real quick. Um, now this is a veterinary drug we're talking. It about. was yeah, that's yeah, that's like animal tranquilizer, yeah, horse tranquilizer, yeah. or something like that. And um, it was cheap though. Mm. It was cheap, and uh, so it was you know it was uh, it was real cheap, and weed was cheap. I mean, you get a four finger dime and a two finger nickel, you know. And when you go to buy your weed, not that I really bought a lot of weed, but I did. Um, you took your fat finger, your fat finger, your fat fingered friend to the weed house with you, so the weed went by the width of your finger, the width of your finger, and the width of these four fingers. So if your friend got fat ass hands, he can get you a better bag of weed. Okay, and that's that's how we did it. It was in a sandwich bag, and you put it down, you laid it down, and you put your finger to the side of it. And that determines how thick the bag was. Then you had the four fingers on top. That determined how wide the bag was. Okay, and by doing that, that was ten dollars. Half of that was five dollars. And when I looked up one day and somebody put some weed in a little bag this big for twenty dollars, I'm like, I ain't fucking that shit no more. I keep that shit. And that chronic hit in '92. Keep, keep, keep that shit. <laughs>
Damn. So you're saying Sherman was, was the shit. What did that smell like? I just, I, I it know. smelled like medicine, man. Okay. You know, it was the one thing about Sherm that was really horrible. If you had it anywhere on you, it smelled like mint, like strong mint leaves. Okay. okay. And you could smell that shit a mile away. Mm. Okay. A mile away. Did you ever sell dope? I didn't really sell dope. I knew people that had dope that needed these people to buy dope, and I would make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> the middleman, the broker. I was always, my daddy always threatened me with that shit, and I'm like, nah, man, I can't do that, but I know somebody can help you here. Okay, that kind of thing. <laughs> you just explained something earlier with the four-finger lids and all that that these kids know nothing about nowadays. You literally went from the time where you had to meet up with the dude, probably, you know, at a certain time in a certain place, you know, it had to be discreet, it was illegal, and now you could literally drive five minutes and there's three weed shops. What, what's your take on this whole marijuana thing now? You know what, man? Uh, we, we was growing up, there was a couple of different types of weed. They had Mexican weed that was dirt, that was dirt, dirt weed. You know, you headache might get a, more of a headache than a high. Then you had the Acapulco Gold, and that shit was beautiful. It was so pretty, you didn't want to set it on fire. Then you had a uh, tie stick. Mm. Tie stick. Right? Kind of brown? Tie stick was red. Oh, well, okay. I'm saying it was green on a stick about that long. And it literally was tied to a stick, but it was actually tie, T H A I, tie stick. But it was tied to a stick. It was 20 bucks back in the 70s. But you need a couple of leaves. <laughs> a couple of leaves would change your day, okay? And but it was one thing about it was it was all natural. And I tell people this all the time, and I embarrass professors at colleges when I ask this question: What was one thing we had to do to smoke weed? First of all, I asked who all smoked weed back in the seventies. Yeah, most of the professors was raising hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I asked you, what did we have to do in, in, in back in the 70s before we could smoke a joint? Separate the seeds. Uh -huh. We had to have a shoebox. Took the, took the zigzag papers, the leaves and zigzag papers. You, 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 you uh, tilted the box down slightly and you lifted the weed and, you, and the seeds would roll out. Now, if you didn't roll the seeds out and the seeds got hot and popped, on your polyester oh, pants, smell too. you burn a hole in your pants and you burn, get, a, get a hole in your leg. Yeah. Okay? This is real shit. I'm these telling kids, you, I'm, 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 these I'm, kids don't know about that they smell. They don't know about this shit. They don't know about that <laughs> shit right there. And I, 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 uh, I wonder, because I, you know, I, 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 I see things sometimes, man, that people, nobody else really sees. I know I'm a, I, sound, I, might, I might sound crazy to some of y'all, but y'all think about this shit before you make before you judge me as being Kanye ish. You ain't got the answers. You ain't got the answers, Sway. Weed is legal, and we live in a food desert. And as you all know, one thing you're gonna do when you get high, you gonna go eat something, a yam yam, a bing bing, a ho ho, ding dong. Kids gonna drink something, some soda. And you get a two liter soda for a dollar. One thing I noticed in the black community, and y'all can check it if you want to, you ain't gonna take my word for it. Diabetes runs rampant. Mm -hmm. If your money is tight and you're eating wrong, you're gonna buy the wrong shit. You're gonna buy a 99 cent taco, you're gonna buy some Del, uh, uh, Taco Bell, you're going to go to 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven sell three things. Sugar, salt, and, 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 and tobacco. That's it. Sugar, salt, and tobacco. And as I look at these elections, and I ride around the hood, it's two things I see a whole lot of. That's drugstores, whether it be CVS, Rite Aid, whatever the case may be. And I also see a lot of these damn DaVita clinics with di uh, dialysis. Mm -hmm. And most people may not realize that kidney failure and kidney issues is a direct result of uh, diabetes. Yeah. Everybody I know in my family that ever had diabetes had kidney problems. Eventually went on dialysis and eventually died. 
you think weed is going to get you eating worse in the middle of the night, and it's going to lead to higher rate of diabetes. Thank you. you 